decision-making and action steps for older adults with multiple chronic conditions. This webinar is co-sponsored by two organizations in aging research, the American Geriatric Society and the Healthcare Systems Research Network and Older American Independence Center's Aging Initiative. My name is Heather Whitson. I'm the director of the Duke University Aging Center, chair of the AGS Research Committee, and I co-lead the Aging Initiative Dissemination Work Group along with Leah Hansen at Health Partners. Before we get started, I need to cover a few technical details. Due to the number of registrants for today's webinar, we've placed most of the phone lines on mute to reduce audio feedback. So unless you are logged in as a host or a panelist, your line sh should be muted. I'll also ask the hosts and panelists to please mute their lines while they're waiting to speak. However, we welcome and encourage audience participation using the chat feature of the webinar software. When you would like to interact with the presenter, you can click the chat bubble icon at the bottom toolbar, and then you can type your questions into the chat box. Be sure to select the to address as everyone if you're submitting a question. That way the hosts can acknowledge questions in order during the final 20 minutes of the webinar. If you have technical or logistical questions, we ask that you submit those using the chat box, but select the host, Alicia Medina Gallagher, to chat privately. Please make sure that you identify yourself by either name or participant ID so that the webinar hosts can help troubleshoot any problem that you're having with audio or other issues. For those of you who will be applying for CME credits, you will be directed to the exam after closing out the webinar. We'll be sending a follow-up email that will also have the link to the CME exam as well as directions on how to access the recording that we will post online next week. We extend a huge thanks to Alicia Medina Gallagher at AGS, as well as Catherine and Zoni and Chris DeLude at the Myers Primary Care Institute, who do amazing work behind the scenes to make this webinar series possible. And now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Caroline Baum is a practicing geriatrician and palliative care physician, as well as the Diane and Arthur Belfer Professor of Geriatric Medicine at NYU Langone Health. She's conducted extensive research and led numerous clinical interventions and healthcare redesign projects for complex patients, particularly frail elders and patients with MCCs and geriatric conditions. Together with Dr. Mary Tonetti, she has developed and leads Patient Pri Priorities Care, which will be discussed further in today's presentation. Next, you'll hear from Dr. Cynthia Boyd. Dr. Boyd is a professor at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in the Department of Medicine, Division of Geriatric Medicine and Gerontology, and is a core faculty member at the Johns Hopkins Center on Aging and Health and the Roger C. Lippitz Center for Integrated Health Care. Dr. Boyd is trained in internal medicine, geriatric medicine, and epidemiology. Dr. Boyd's main interests include the optimal care of older adults with multiple chronic conditions. She was co-chair of the American Geriatric Society's expert panel on the care of older adults with multimorbidity. And Dr. Boyd is co-PI with Dr. Steinman of the newly formed U.S. Deprescribing Research Network funded by the NIA. Finally, Dr. Mary Tonetti is a professor of medicine and public health and is chief of geriatrics at Yale School of Medicine. She is a leading expert in the area of falls and fall injury risk factors identification and prevention. Dr. Tonetti is leading a national effort to develop and test an approach to health care that aligns primary and specialty care to focus on the health priorities of older adults with multiple conditions. She also chairs a group of advisors helping large health systems become age-friendly. Dr. Tonetti has received numerous awards, is a member of the National Academy of Medicine, and is the recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. Without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to today's first speaker, Dr. Blom. Hello, everyone. This is Caroline Blom, and I'm so thrilled to be here. Thank you all for joining. I think you're going to have a very uh, interesting hour. Um, uh, and I'm really honored to be here and able to talk with you with uh, Cynthia and with Mary. Uh, before I get started, I want to just reference the learning objectives because some of you are going to be getting CME and you can read them, but uh, a lot of 
the, the coming webinar will certainly be related to those learning objectives. So Chris, next. So let's start with a case. Our case is Mr. T. He's an 83-year-old man with fatigue, decreased appetite, uh, weakness. He has lots of symptoms. He has multiple diseases. He's had a previous heart attack. He has diabetes, hypertension, heart failure with low injection fraction. He has osteoporosis, um, depression, CKD, just like many of the patients that, that I certainly have and that many of you on the webinar see daily. So, of course, he thinks that his medications are causing a lot of the symptoms. And he certainly thinks that he's spending too much time involved in his health care. Next. So what does the care for his chronic conditions mean for him? Well, he has multiple doctors, he has multiple problems, he has multiple medicines. His cardiologist is concerned about his heart failure and blood pressure, wants to increase the beta blocker and the statin and consider an ICD. His endocrinologist is concerned about his A1C and some fractures, wants to start insulin and bisphosphonate. Psychiatrist concerned about depression, wants to decrease or stop the beta blocker or add another antidepressant. The primary care doc is concerned about his blood pressure and his A1C and all the conflicting recommendations. So what does this all mean for Mr. T? He has 20 healthcare visits a month, including visits and blood draws. He's got about 15 medications with fatigue, weakness, and decreased appetite. And he has to navigate conflicting recommendations from his condition. Next. So he sort of illustrates the rationale behind what we're going to be talking about today. So few older adults with multiple conditions uh, have, um, are actually part of the evidence base for our evidence-based medicine, these people have not been in the randomized clinical trials. And persons with multiple conditions may have less benefit from treatments than, than uh, RCTs suggest. So in, were people with multiple conditions, what outcome, in fact, would define benefit? Next. Care for these people may also be burdensome. And uh, many authors and researchers have found out that people say caring for chronic conditions can be more burdensome than the conditions themselves. And here is just a, a view that you can't even read and you're not even supposed to be able to read and the patients certainly have trouble doing uh, on the left side of the screen all the things they might have to do if they have common chronic conditions like hypertension, diabetes, osteoporosis, osteoarthritis, and COPD. Quite a burden of care for the patient. Next. Care may also cause unintentional harm, and there's evidence for this. Uh, one in five patients with multiple chronic conditions can receive a guideline-based medicine that exacerbates another condition. And, of course, patients and caregivers report that the, the workload for the self-management is as burdensome as the conditions themselves. And you can see some references, and there are many others that uh, relate to these points. Next. But more importantly than all these other problems is that care is not always consistent with what matters to the patient. And we know, and Terry Freed and others have, have shown, that patients vary in their outcome goals. They vary what they want out of their health care. Many people, in fact, probably a, a plurality, really want to be independent and maintain function. They prefer symptom relief. And they don't always want to live longer. That may not always be the goal of our older patients with multiple chronic conditions. So people vary in their care preferences and, and the burden that they're willing to put up with, and they vary in their outcome goals. Next. So that brings us to the American Geriatric Society guiding principles and approach for the care of older adults with multimorbidity. And, you know, American Geriatric Society and a team, uh, Cynthia Boyd was one of those leading figures in this. Uh, realize that for these multiple chronic condition patients with burdensome care, poor evidence, you know, how should we approach their care? And we'll, much, much of the webinar today will be relating to these as we'll go through them in some detail. But first, I want, I want to go through them a little bit too. So elicit and incorporate patient and family caregiver preferences into medical decision making. Recognize the limitations of the evidence base for your patients. Frame clinical management decisions within the context of harm, burdens, benefits, and prognosis. Not always easy to do, and we'll be talking more about that. Consider treatment complexity and feasibility when making clinical management decisions, and use strategies that optimize the benefit, minimize harm, and enhance quality of life. So as I say, much of, please go back, Chris. 
much of the webinar will be going through these. And uh, I want to talk now about patient priorities care. Because when you think about these guiding principles, how do you operationalize them? And that's what ties in patient priorities care, at, which we will be talking about in the, in the webinar. We'll sort of intertwine these guiding principles and how patient priorities care is a, a way to, uh, to make these principles come to life and to actually guide us in applying these principles to the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, care of our patients. And um, since much of the webinar will be going through how patient priorities care operationalizing these guiding principles, I want to point out that I'm going to be talking about point one. And point one is where you elicit and incorporate patient family caregiver preferences. For our patients with multiple chronic conditions, the views of the patients and what really is meaningful to the patients, what they want out of their health care, uh, their current care planning, what do they want their health care to do for them is very important. And patient and, care and family uh, uh, outlook and views and priorities really guide how we approach all the decision making that uh, we want to do for these complex patients. Okay, Chris, next. So patient priorities care provides a bridge a bridge between the traditional disease-based decision-making and care that we all have as our tools for all the chronic conditions that patients may have. But a bridge between this disease-based decision-making and decision-making based on what matters to patients. So decision-making based on the patient's priorities. Okay, next. So what is patient priorities care? And I'm going to talk a little bit about this, and, and uh, others will too, uh, Cynthia and, and Mary will also bring it up. So patient priorities care was developed by a group of stakeholders, maybe up to 150, um, about uh, five years ago. And many uh, big teams been working on it ever since. And uh, what it does, it, it really turns, it, it has three sort of principles itself. The first thing, and which I'm going to talk about, is to identify the patient's health priorities and their outcome goals given their healthcare preferences. So the patients have to learn, have to be prepared to figure out and what their priorities are. Once that's done, those priorities are transmitted uh, uh, to the provider, and together, provider and the patient decide to stop harmful harmful treatments and to start or continue things that help patients' priorities. This uh, decision making is communicated with. Uh, other, other care, the other providers than everyone. And so that care ends up being aligned with the patient's priorities. And if a patient has a change in their health status or something changes, everything is reassessed. Next. So what I'm going to start with is how does patient priorities care start? How do we do that first guiding principle and involve the patient and their family and caregiver in developing their patient priorities and participate in decisions? So uh, patient priorities care sort of developed some tools, patient workbook and a facilitator workbook, and you can go to the website. But I'm going to talk to you about some of the main principles that we've discovered uh, with patient priorities care. Next slide. So for the patient to be to, to determine their health priorities, it often helps if a member of the team can help them. And they start with clarifying the values, and uh, values are very stable, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Through the values, they, they I, um, inform smart health outcome goals, so the patient can work on, figure out what, their health, what they want out of their health care. The patient can also identify their preferences, uh, what they're willing and able to do to achieve their outcome goals. And then they learn and practice engaging actively in their healthcare with their providers. So next. So exploring values. Uh, values are sort of stable and they are what really uh, inform the rest of patient priorities. And here's some of the values, and these are actually evidence-based. There's been a lot of research about this, and you'll see some of the references as we go on. But patients, some patients really value connection and relationships. Many patients value enjoying life, productivity, personal growth. Many of them value managing their health and their symptoms. And we know that functioning is big. People want to be self-sufficient, independent, have dignity. So patients can figure out what their values are. And these are stable. And that's why it's always good for them to start with the values. Next. From the values, the patients 
come up with SMART goals. These are actionable things that they and their, their doctor and their nurse practitioner, their providers can work on to achieve. So these SMART goals, health outcome goals, are based on values uh, that link the goal to what matters. And just to point out that health outcome goals are different from behavioral goals, like they want to uh, have a healthy diet or exercise. These are really, their, I, I think of it as what you want your health care to do for you. They are specific and measurable. They are actionable and realistic, something that the patient would like to be able to do to keep in mind their health conditions and their course. They like to be able to, they have to be planned through and they should be flexible so they can be uh, revised if needed if health status changes. It's, it may sound a little bit complicated, but when you really think about your patients, they do have these types of goals. They want to be able to work in the garden, but they don't want to be fatigued. It makes it difficult. They want to be able to babysit their grandchild. They want to be able to go to church every Sunday. They want to be able to go to the senior center and visit with their friends. Patients can definitely come up with these smart health outcome goals. Next. But after that, they also have to think about their preferences. What are they willing and able to do to achieve these outcome goals? And this sort of relates to the work of being a, a patient. And you can see that if you're a patient, here are the tasks that you may or may not have to do. You have to take medications. You have to go to healthcare visits. You get testing and procedures and safe self-management activities. And again, on the left side of the screen, you can see that a, a worksheet that Patient Priorities Care has developed for patients. And they can just think about all the things that they're doing, what they think helps them, what they're willing to do, what they think is not helpful or is difficult for them to do. Next slide. And a final step in patient preparation for patient priorities care is to learn how to talk with and work with their clinician. Um, so patient priorities care works with patients to evaluate barriers. You know, is there a time problem? Do they have trouble understanding? Is there a health literacy problem? Um, works with patients to acknowledge the difficulty yet importance of communicating with patients and communicating their priorities. We tell the patients, help the clinicians help you. If you don't share what you are able and not able to do or what you really want out of your health care, your doctor may not figure it out or your provider may not. So this, again, is very important to do. Next slide. So now to, this all might sound good, but is it, does it work and is it feasible? And uh, Mary and, and Cynthia will go into this more, but in fact, there is a body of research that's been done over the past five years that shows that this, in fact, is completely feasible. The vast majority of patients can work this through, can figure out their values, can come up with SMART goals, can articulate their preferences, and communicate with their doctor. Uh, in our pilot study, which uh, Mary will talk about more, 93% of eligible patients agreed to do it, and they all managed to go through the process. Many of the patients actually picked it up relatively quickly with appropriate guidance. And of course, a lot of the work uh, on patient priorities score was developing that guidance for the patients. Um, but they, many of them can do this in one to two sessions of 20 to 30 minutes each. So this is very feasible, very doable, and, uh, and very uh, acceptable to patients and providers. Next slide. So just uh, to reiterate, from the patient side for patient's priorities care, and then sort of going back to the guiding principles of caring for patients with multiple chronic conditions, involving the patients, involving the caregivers. So part of the way to operationalize involving the patients is the patients uh, need to know their health priorities, uh, uh, figure out their health outcome go goals and what they're willing and able to do, and become an active partner in decisions with their clinicians and do what they're willing and able to do. So I think with this, I believe the next slide, I'm turning it over to Cynthia. Is that right? Yes. So thank great. you very much. And I, great. Hi, Cynthia. Hi. Thank you so much, Caroline. And I'm very happy to um, be here and see so many people participating in this webinar. Um, appreciate your time. So uh, just a little bit of transition from Caroline. So um, just in the past year, working with folks from American Geriatric Society as well as American College of Physicians 
and American College of Cardiology, we worked to develop a uh, really a framework to translate the guiding principles um, from AGS into um, a, a framework for decision making for clinicians who provide both primary and specialty care to older adults with multiple chronic conditions. And I, th um, I think you'll see how this um, is a, a, um, nicely sort of able to be played out in patient um, priorities care. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so this is an echo of a slide Caroline showed earlier um, uh, that illustrates um, a, a framework to turn the guiding principles really into um, action steps um, to be used in clinical practice. And so um, the first um, action step, Caroline did a really lovely job, I think, illustrating the first part about it, which is to um, identify and communicate around the patient's health priorities, which are their, both their outcome goals and their preferences for care. Um, an additional piece I'm going to go into in just a minute is some, is, uh, some thoughts about their health trajectory. Um, and then the latter parts of this um, uh, flow um, will will keep moving through as um, as we go through the talk. And just to note that um, I think implementing uh, these action steps is something that is, um, so it's not something you do just once and forget about. And so there, there may be times where you kind of enter this flow at a different, um, at a different point in time or, um, uh, and then, you know, circle back to one of the other ones in more detail or to evaluate how changes have gone at later times. Uh, next slide, please. So the um, first MCC action is to identify and communicate patients' health priorities and health trajectory. Uh, um, when we're identifying and communicating patients' health priorities, we want to use a validated approach to identify them, and we need to be able to uh, sh um, transmit or share those health priorities with um, providers. The second piece of this is to assess and communicate patients' um, health trajectory. And in here, we think about estimating life expectancy, their overall trajectory in terms of other outcomes, and what is the lag time or time horizon to benefit of things that the person is already doing or considering doing. A key piece of this is really to understand someone's readiness to discuss their trajectory or prognosis and to um, assess what their own perceptions of their prognosis and trajectory are. Next slide, please. So um, for the health priorities part, we want to, um, uh, I'm just going to take this a little bit further than where Car Caroline w was. We want to start with the one thing that matters most to people. And it can be helpful to frame this in terms of a specific ask. So the thing I most want to focus on and is some symptom or problem. But that is in order so that the patient can um, do something that they want to do. And we also want to understand how they think either the health problem or perhaps it's treatment, and sometimes it can be both, may be contributing. Next slide. So thinking back to the patient Mr. T. Caroline spoke about, an example of this might be I want to be less dizzy and unsteady in the morning so that I can keep going for walks to see my neighbors and take care of my dog. Next slide. Um, thinking a little bit more about health trajectory, some, there's some ways that we might be able to do that for life expectancy can be found, um, for example, on um, ePrognosis, which has been um, uh, um, developed and put together by many members of the American Geriatric Society. But we want to also think about likely changes in the per person's health status for other outcomes. We all know that function and independence matter um, a lot to people, and so we may not have um, perfect tools, but we want to be sort of prepared to be thinking about that. And as I mentioned earlier, we want to be thinking about um, the, the trajectory for both of those types of outcomes in terms of how it might parallel with the time horizon to benefit, particularly when we're um, thinking about life expectancy. Next slide. 
Um, so examples of some questions that can help um, assess a person's um, own perceptions of their health trajectory and how willing and um, interested they are in discussing it might be what is your understanding of how your illnesses will affect your day-to-day -day life and your health or how do you think the next six months or it could be a year or maybe you're interested in a few years will be for you in terms of your health and function. Next slide. So the second um, MCC action step is to stop, start, or continue care based on health priorities, potential benefit versus harm and burden, and health trajectory. We want to um, acknowledge uncertainty and variable health priorities in decision making and when we're communicating with patients and their families as well as each other. We want to stop or not start medicines. Um, for which harm and burden may outweigh benefit. Um, and this includes um, stopping medicines that are deemed inappropriate for older adults, avoiding medication cascades, which are when we add another medicine in order to treat a side effect of an initial medicine. Um, we can perform serial trials to see which treatments may be contributing to bothersome symptoms in many cases. Um, and we want to discontinue treatments that are no longer indicated or needed and review and adjust self-management tasks, realizing that they are part of the, um, the, what patients experience when we're treating, but we tend not to think about them quite the same way um, when we, um, as we do about medicines. Um, and I think a key piece here is that we may end up sometimes starting or continuing care that um, is essentially the, the mirror image of this, that where benefit is outweighing harms and burdens and when the, the care is something that patients are willing and um, able to do or to you know, be able to tolerate. So then we also want to consider whether the patient has advanced illness or life expectancy that affects the benefits and harms of treatments. And the, the health trajectory and time to benefit may be particularly relevant when we're thinking about preventive interventions. Uh, for example, we can explain the cessation of screening and prevention as a shift in priorities and use positive messaging. Next slide. So I just want to echo back here as we are sort of moving through um, that in um, we are able to, um, having identified and communicated about priorities and trajectories, we then want to really think about what we want to stop, start, or continue based on that um, for the individual we're caring for. Next slide, please. Um, and this figure um, has, uh, is in our AGS article, but comes originally from um, the Patient and Priorities Care Group. And just to note that um, what we are probably talking about, which patients are we really talking about, are really um, the, where this approach, where priorities are um, and what the patients are able and willing to do is really directly informing the way we think about evidence and make decisions is for the very large group of people um, who might fall into this uncertain category with a two to 10 year life expectancy approximately with an increasing number and severity of conditions and with some degree of impaired function. Um, and you can see here, you know, these are sort of rough estimates, but people where different approaches to care uh, might actually be the, the, um, the way you first turn. Although I think many of us would agree that what patients um, value and desire should always inform um, uh, their care. Um, even if people are, um, you know, um, falling into a place where disease-based guidelines are consistent um, with patient preferences and when we're thinking about palliative care. Next slide, please. So some strategies for aligning decision making with priorities include um, arriving at a shared decision through agreeing on information about the patient's priorities, their burden of treatment, what the family concerns are, what other conditions are in play, and what their likely trajectory is. And we want to use the patient's health outcome goals and care preferences rather than their diseases to select and discuss care. For example, there are different things that we could do, but knowing your conditions, your overall health, and what matters most to you, I suggest we try 
and then fill in what you're recommending. But that is keeping the frame in that it's really what people value that's driving decisions um, and what their goals are, not um, just what their diseases are. Um, we need to, um, when we're trying to reconcile differences between the patient or patient and their family and the clinician, we want to present trade-offs. We want to make sure we're realistic about absolute benefits. We want to understand if the patient understands alternatives and then um, work to come to a decision that, that um, is acceptable to them. When we're when we're thinking about how many people with multiple chronic conditions are seeing multiple providers, both primary care and specialists, um, there's also some important things to think about in terms of reconciling differences among them. We want to take the approach of collaborative negotiations and accept that there is often no one best answer and that we can brainstorm compromise options. Next slide, please. So some possible interventions for Mr. T would include reviewing all medicines to see which ones are helping and which ones are leading to side effects and conduct serial trials of um, potentially making changes. We could decrease unneeded specialty visits and use e-consults um, when possible. A trial of physical therapy for gait improvement and endurance may also end up helping with pain and working on non-constipating pain control and educational and behavioral management of constipation may also improve um, his, uh, his well-being. And there probably may be opportunities to simplify um, disease, uh, his diabetes regimen. Next slide. So the third action step is to align decisions and care among patients, caregivers, and other clinicians with the patient's health priorities and health trajectory. Um, so uh, we want to affirm a shared understanding of what patients um, prioritize and what information should inform decision making and um, encourage patients and family and caregivers to participate in this decision making. Um, when we're aligning decisions between patients and clinicians that have, when we have different perspectives, we want to link our decisions to something meaningful to the patient and ensure that their goals are consistent with their healthcare preferences. We can identify and change bothersome aspects of treatment, and we need to accept patients' decisions and recognize that they can and often are, you know, reevaluated after a trial. We want to align um, decisions when clinicians have different perspectives and recommendations by focusing discussion on their priorities, not only diseases, and acknowledge the absence of one right answer uh, for patients with MCCs. We, and as I noted earlier, use collaborative negotiation to arrive at shared recommendations. Next slide. So this is an example of how um, uh, patient Priorities Care was able to um, use uh, and a template in the EHR in order to focus care this way. And I realize that it comes up relatively small for you, but hopefully you can see um, that kind of front and center is what the um, that what matters, the patient's likely health trajectory, excuse me, what matters most, if there are any key trade-offs, what those might be. Um, the health outcome goals are can be listed, and you can see there's room for more than one, as is often the case. We want to identify what is helpful care um, from what they're currently doing and what is difficult and bothersome care. Um, and uh, I, I know Mary and Caroline would be happy to answer more questions about this as we move forward. Next slide. Um, so I just want to briefly talk a little bit about how clinicians translate priorities into, into decisions. Uh, Mary and her colleagues recently published this um, based on the work they've done, um, talk, working with both primary care and specialists. Next slide. Um, so the, some of the key learnings are that we want to start with the one thing that matters most, conduct serial trials, use patients' priorities, Focus on achieving an activity. It's not always. It's not often not about eliminating symptoms, and using collaborative negotiations when there's um, differing uh, views. Next slide. 
um, collaborative ne- negotiations work best um, when we are when clinicians felt, excuse me, that collaborative negotiations work best when we recognize there's no one best answer and agree on Im- what information should inform the decisions we make. And as noted earlier, we want to um, brainstorm compromises when possible. Next slide. Some of the challenges are that there's often uncertainty and complexity. Clinicians noted that they don't always know where to start um, and that even though we know it's the case, there's often not an obvious right or best decision. And um, I think we all need to develop greater comfort with that. Um, sometimes there's no single identifiable or remediable symptom to target. and Clinical trajectories are, can both change and there's uncertainty. Uh, they also identify differing perspectives on what matters most. For example, when patients prioritize current discomfort or treatment burden and the clinician is worrying about an event in the future, um, and that there can be a disconnect between um, what we, matters most to the patient and what we as clinicians are focusing on. There are often trade-offs between burden and benefit, um, and there often are differing priorities and care recommendations among different clinicians clearing for the patient. Now I'm going to turn things over to Mary, who's going to share some of the results from their uh, implementing this in, in, in practice. Uh, thank you, Caroline, and uh, thank you, Cynthia. And um, just to, over the next few minutes, I'm just going to talk a little bit about our results of implementing the action steps in, in, pri- in patient priorities care and talk a little bit about a research agenda and what are some of the facilitators and challenges involved. Uh, using, the, uh, using the approach that Caroline and Cynthia talked about, we studied in uh, two offices of a large primary care practice uh, here in Connecticut. We uh, compared what happened with people who underwent primary patient priorities care versus those of uh, a very similar group of people who received usual care. And as you can see, these people all had um, multiple chronic conditions and received care for multiple individuals. We did a comparison follow-up over about nine months of follow-up. Next slide, please. And as Caroline identified, we, the, uh, this approach of patient priorities identification of people with multiple chronic condition seems quite feasible. All the clinicians that we invited, including primary care and cardiology, agreed to participate. Over the entire time, 70% of patients offered patient priorities care accepted, and that's a quite a large number when one when, when thinks about new interventions. All of the people were able to complete the process, um, as we noted, and it took about 20 to 30 minutes with about 15 minutes of chart review and documentation. And we know in a busy practice and workflow, time is, is definitely money. Um, in terms of clinician time, we found after they were trained, it took about 15 minutes of extra visit time for the first two visits for the clinicians, and then the, the time uh, if anything was perhaps a little shorter, certainly no longer than their previous than their previous visits, and we can talk about some reimbursement issues related to that. Um, next, please. So, what did we find compared to those who received usual care? Those who received patient priorities care, um, their clinician notes that we reviewed over nine months showed that in 66% of the time, there was at least one decision made between clinicians and their patient and caregivers for whom attention to their outcome goals or care preferences were identified 66% of the time uh, versus none of the time in the usual care, a really major difference. We were able to get clinicians to focus on goals and preferences. We also saw a difference in what we call unwanted care. And we had a definition for unwanted care that included some um, identification in the electronic health record that clinicians had considered patients' goals and preferences or considered whether the benefit was greater than the harm or continued to be indicated uh, in in any decisions of care. And we found that in the case of patient priorities uh, patients, twice as many medications were stopped 
than in usual care. There were 20% fewer tests ordered and 40% fewer self-management tasks were added. And I think this is important because as Caroline pointed out, people are saying that taking care of their chronic conditions is as burdensome as the conditions. We also saw using a standardized instrument the uh, a greater reduction in perceived treatment burden in those receiving usual care, uh, receiving patient priority care versus usual care. Next slide, please. So what we did, um, we identified talking with um, people from the American College of Physicians and American College of Cardiology, what were some of the concerns that clinicians had before we instituted this patient priorities care um, and, and multiple chronic disease action steps. Not surprisingly, there was concern that we practice in a guideline-based culture that values the clinician's ability to teach the patient what's best. Um, that particularly among the specialists, survival is the primary goal. And we heard, and you've probably heard this as well, if you're not alive, you can't do anything else. So moving from survival to other outcomes remains a challenge. Clinicians were very honest in telling us they were more concerned about what their peers think that what they do rather than what patients want. Um, the, also, I'm sure you've heard this often, that electronic health records are not organized around what matters to patients or what matters to clinicians for that matter. A lot of concern that quality metrics remain very disease specific and don't necessarily align with what matters to patients. I think one of the uh, challenges that were identified at the beginning and throughout the time that we had the what would seem the opposite challenges, but but certainly key ones that um, we're already doing this. This is nothing new. Versus you can't do this. We have to follow the guidelines, and I think that remains a challenge. There was a concern that people would have unrealistic and changeable health priorities, and I will tell you that following the process that we developed and tested, that was not an issue uh, in this particular group, and that's why going through the values to get to the SMART goals is so key. Next slide, please. We also asked clinicians of the cardiologists in primary care what they felt they would need to do this type of approach for people with chronic conditions. First of all, don't give us any more guidelines. We have enough of them. Tell us how to do the conversation. Uh, second of all, summarize and simplify and condense a few key principles that transcend individual decisions. And, and Cynthia showed you what those were, beginning with uh, what mattered most to people, use serial trials, um, uh, decide based on priorities, not just diseases. Those were the simple principles that came out of our work. Um, there was a lot of discussion about, they acknowledged that uncertainty was there, but they felt uncomfortable they, um, uh, communicating the certainty. They were interested in that. They also wanted to make sure this was not perceived as giving up or rationing or abandoning individuals. A lot of discussion about how to de-escalate a uh, therapy. And during the time that this, that this work was going on, the um, larger uh, uh, world of de-prescribing came into, came, uh, emerged and was certainly a lot of overlap with what we were doing and I think really um, are very synergistic. Concerned about time and reimbursement to do it and they wanted evidence of benefit of patient priorities line decision making which are now as, as um, mentioned we are now able to give them in a, a paper that was just um, published this week in JAMA Internal Medicine. Next slide please. So what did clinicians say after the pilot? Well, we get carried away, um, but just saying, how does this make life better for you? This clinician really felt it changed how they thought and interacted with their patients. Um, another clinician said, however, well, it was important, extremely useful to raising awareness for patients, but it hasn't really translated into much action on my part. And this helps my relationship, but I still get measured on blood pressure, BMI, and A1C. Clearly, we have a ways to go yet. Um, in moving the needle on this approach to care. Next slide, please. And, and what did patients say? Well, it got me to realize that my doctor really is interested in my care. It's changed my assertiveness. Where I used to keep to myself, it's given me more confidence. And he, being the, his, her primary care provider, said it's important to him to find the questions I might have. In other words, help him with my, help him help me with my problem. So clearly, 
seeing activation of patients as a result of, of this uh, approach to care. Next slide, please. So in the broader work um, funded by PCORI and led by Caroline Blom and uh, Libby Hoy of Patient and Family Centered Care, there were several meetings uh, involving multiple providers including uh, patients, caregivers, research providers, health system people, where we really identified what were some of the questions approaching this approach to uh, taking care of people with multiple chronic conditions. What, are, what were some researchable questions? Next slide, please. And um, through those three meetings, came up with about 178 unique questions that were generated at uh, these meetings that were then analyzed from more general themes and were eventually compiled into these themes and reviewed by a working group that in uh, Long Beach in uh, 2017. And they were voted on of, amongst this uh, uh, very interdisciplinary group of patients, families, caregivers, clinicians, specialists, and researchers. And I was at a couple of those meetings, and it was really wonderful to see all these different groups coming from different perspectives, but really identified um, a group of issues that everybody could agree on was really important that needed to get research to figure out how to provide care to this population. Uh, next slide, please. And on this slide are the nine topic areas that were felt to be the most important to address if we're really going to provide patient priorities line care for older adults with multiple chronic conditions. There was general agreement that we need to start at the training level when nurses, social workers, physicians, physicians assistants are still first learning how to make decisions and communicate, have to start earlier. And I will say we've already begun developing um, a curriculum for medical students and, and residents here at Yale to do this. Um, in terms of translating these general concepts into decision making in, in a very busy clinic, we need tools that help us to do this implementation. And some of those are under development, and hopefully people on the call will be interested in further developing these. Again, general uh, consensus that we need uh, patient priorities aligned quality metrics. We need to move beyond multiple disease quality metrics into those that really talk about care concordant with people's priorities. Again, a very hot and important area. We needed to, this was in a very homogeneous population here in Connecticut. This needs to be tested in different patient groups. Um, does it work with people with dementia? Does it work in very underserved populations? Very important. Role, who can, who can and should um, elicit the priorities? Uh, one of, some of the clinician groups felt that physicians were probably not the best people to do it, but perhaps were possible. Is it social work? Is it the medical assistant? Is it peer groups? Can this be done by the caregiver? Can it be done by the patient himself or herself? Very important area. Um, obviously, a lot of interest in the electronic health record and HIT support, health information technology, supporting this, um, incorporating it into the busy workflow. A lot of concern about the business case. Why would health systems or practices want to do this? What's in it for them? What are the financial and other incentives to doing this? and how do we scale up? As we know, there's a lot of innovations that occur that never get in, implemented broadly. How do you scale this up? Even if you think it's the right way to do it, how do you get it done? Um, data is always important. Increasing evidence um, of benefit and effect on patient reported outcomes. And finally, uh, interest in, in uh, how do you build the relationships? How do, how do you really move that relationship between clinicians and patients from from uh, doctor or mother you know, knows best to this is a true partnership. The patient and caregiver are experts in what matters most. The clinicians may be experts in which part of their healthcare can get them there. Clearly a partnership that needs to happen um, were, were the key themes that emerged um, from, from this work over a few years. Next slide, please. And I just want to stop here and just um, uh, knowledge, the uh, support of the American Geriatric Society and the Aging Initiative, as well as the support from our multiple uh, funders. And um, thank you. And I'm going to pass this back to Leah to address some of the questions. And I can see that they have been popping up in the chat box. So thank you for that. 
Hi, this is Leah Hansen. I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to our speakers for their excellent presentations. Now is the time for any questions that you have. Uh, so please feel free to clock, click on the chat bubble icon on the bottom toolbar and type your questions in that chat box. We have received several questions. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Kristen Lavoy. Um, Kristen asks that the patient priorities care seems to have a lot of overlapping goals with primary and specialty, specialty palliative care models. Can you talk about is there a clear differentiation here with this model? Um, this is Mary. I can take that if you'd like. Um, and, and thank you for that question. Um, we get that question a lot. I think uh, there's, there's a, a couple of different related uh, questions about that. First of all, it's not terribly surprising if you think about the fact that palliative care um, actually emerged from, uh, very largely emerged from geriatrics um, and was built on geriatric principles of recognizing what's important to the patient and complex decision making and uncertainty. Um, so it's not terribly surprising that there, there is a fair amount of overlap. Um, second of all, uh, the, we definitely learned a lot of the communication uh, techniques and their palliative care people were part of our group. Uh, third of all, um, palliative care still remains primarily focused, although certainly moving upstream, uh, uh, on people with advanced illness. And our feeling is this approach to care is really important for everybody, and particularly those with multiple chronic conditions. And our feeling is if we do a good job of getting people to think this way and clinicians to think this way earlier in the health trajectory, then once they're farther advanced, um, the process will be much easier. So I think there's definitely some intended overlap, but also I think it broadens the, um, who, who, who receives this type of care. Thank you. We have a question from Leah Tuzio, um, specifically for Dr. Boyd. Um, can you speak more about who's the best to elicit this feedback? I know you touched on that briefly. Um, right now, they have some researchers doing the elicitation, but they're wondering if a medical assistant could do that um, because they might connect differently with the patients. And what about the thought of trying to do this on the phone in advance of a visit, or do you think it's better in person? So I'll touch on this, and then I'll see if um, Mary wants to Mary uh, wants to chime in about their experience. But I, I definitely think a couple things are key. One is that I do think it's important that the um, physician or provider be sort of prepared and trained to think this way and be able to do it themselves because I think if this information is just presented to the physician and they haven't wrapped their their mind around this way of thinking that there'd still be that disconnect but I don't um, think and I think Mary's and Caroline's experience backs this up that it, it must be the provider and in fact it may actually um, be uh, more in, um, uh, able to be kind of built into workflows if if the, if other team members are involved. Um, you probably noted that on the research agenda, you know, th thinking through who is the best person and and when and how, I think are all really important pieces of the um, research agenda. Um, you know, in terms of whether it can be, uh, so I don't think we have all the answers yet, and I think there's a lot of things um, to be studied, including, you know, how might you, be, how, if or how might you be able to do this um, over the phone or in advance of the visit with another provider, um, you know, obviously keeping in mind um, many of our patients have hearing impairment, um, et cetera, that, you know, may make that form of communication more challenging. But I'll see if Mary or Car Caroline want to comment based on their experience, which did, um, did use providers other than physicians to be working with patients on these. Yeah, this is Caroline. I just wanted to point out that there may be, uh, first of all, and Mary can talk, the pa sometimes the patients can probably do this themselves with some guidance. So I guess my point is, thinking of all the various types of practices and health systems and things all over the, the country, it may be that there is no right answer and many types of people can do this, can be trained to do this. I do like Cynthia's point of view that the, the providers ought to know how to do it because or ought to be very comfortable because then they might have trouble, you know, doing their pieces of thing to, you know, aligning your decision making with the priorities. But I have a feeling that the answer is going to end up as many people 
and and, uh, and I certainly hope so because that would get it more disseminated. And Mary, do you have a view? No, I, I agree with you completely, and that's a great question. I think the answer is going to be the more flexible, the better. Um, and no matter who does it, the clinician has to be aware of it and incorporate it into their decision making. Well, thanks to all of you. We have a question from Christine Williamson. How do you handle the need to fix within provider and patient families? Uh, this is Carolyn. I, I, I wanted to clarify. Is, does that have, is that sort of related to the uh, procedural uh, specialties? We, one of our, uh, when we were developing the research agenda, we worked with the, Amer the American College of uh, Surgeons, and they have a geriatric quality group. And that was one of the things that the surgeons were very interested in, the fix-it mentality. Like, you know, I'm a proceduralist, I'm a surgeon, I'm going to fix it. And how does, how do you, is, is that what the patient, I, I, I'm not completely sure what the question is referring to, but to me, the surgeons had very interesting input and view about this. And uh, we had quite a, a, a lively discussions about this issue. So is, is that what the questioner is interested in? I believe so. I didn't get any more information, but... Yeah, I, I, well, I, that's what I can speak to because that's when I know it, and Mary and Cindy can chime in. But, you know, the surgeons certainly uh, uh, think that the fix-it mentality is, is ubiquitous in surgery and in some of the uh, interventional specialties, and that they, there has to be some training to think it through. And sometimes they talk about how do, how do you talk to the patient, what's the communication, trying to help the patient and family understand what would be the best result, what would be the worst result, sort of so people can have, a, have an idea that fixing it may not actually be what's going to happen and that there's a wider range of outcomes. So, you know, so understanding trajectories and possible outcomes are one of the, the issues. Another thing that the uh, surgeons were pointed out is there's sort of a surgical journey like you know the you know what do you do before the the procedure what do you do after what what is the trajectory or the the journey through the the post surgical period and that you have to they have to be very transparent and try to communicate these issues with the patients so but you know i think everybody feels that we have a long way to go but we have to start and i think the um some of the interventional, the, the people who are interested in this, uh, the surgeons who are interested in quality of care for older adults, for example, are, uh, sort of, are really uh, taking the ball on the way this one and trying to think about it. Mary or Cynthia, do you have other views? No, I think you handled that well. <laughs> yeah. I, I will tell you that the surgeons have been the people that have come um, personally have, have contacted me the most about interest in this, so I think they do get it because they can't always fix. So identifying an outcome that everybody can agree to that's feasible is a key piece to this. Thank you. We have a question from Grace Jink. In regards to what you're talking about incentives and disincentives, the CMS final rule regulations for discharge planning just came out saying hospitals must have an effective discharge planning process that focuses on patient goals and treatment preferences. And what a great incentive, but can you comment on how is this measured? <laughs> <laughs> well, Grace is always very good about getting right to the point. Um, good, to, good to hear from you, Grace, this Mary. Um, no, it's a great point. I think this is exactly the problem. Who's against identifying people's goals, right? But how do you identify it? How do you measure that? I think really is the holy grail. And that's why one of the, what, at, what I mentioned that I think um, identifying ways to measure goal concordant care is really key. And I will tell you that both NQF and NCQA are interested in, there are groups getting together to do it. I think, I think we're, I think it's frankly years in the making, but at least the fact that people are asking for this is, is, is we're moving in the right direction. Thank you. Now, we certainly have uh, many more questions that we can answer. I think we have time just for one more. And um, Can you comment on your suggestions on how to navigate in that uh, common occurrence of those discordant goals when you have disagreement between patients and their caregivers or family members? Um, I can take that on if you want. This is Mary. Um, it was interesting when we first started doing this. That was one of the things that that 
talk about incentive for the clinicians. Our, I don't know if you remember, Caroline, in our early uh, meeting with the pro-health people, one of their interests in this was exactly that, is, is so often their patients would come in and want one thing, and then their daughter or somebody would call and want something else, and it, it was very difficult. Um, and so there's a couple of ways that we sort of do about this. When we went about identifying people's um, priorities, we always invited uh, family or caregivers to be part of the process, not to articulate necessarily their goals and preferences, but to hear what mattered to the patient at a time that there wasn't a crisis or a decision to be made. And I think, as I recall, about one one out of three times, there was a family member present. Our feeling is also is if you get people to identify what patients want before a crisis, then it's going to be much easier for the clinicians. As you remember, I know this is hard for you, but as you remember, this is what your mom said. Um, so it's 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 one piece of the puzzle of trying to get people aligned in the same on the same page. Um, certainly doesn't solve the problem, but I think it addresses it to some extent. Yeah, I, this is Cynthia. I'll just add that I um, I agree with Mary that I actually think the process of thinking through what people value, what outcomes they want to achieve, and how they're experiencing care, what's burdensome, what's working, um, it, like getting people to think proactively about that um, is is good, and it can be done with patients and families, and just the getting people together to identify. Those things is important. Some work by my colleague Jennifer Wolf also notes that patients and um, uh, identifies that patients and family members or visit whoever is a visit companion really can identify sort of shared things that they want to talk about, um, and that, that work also adds the idea that patients and families can actually really work together to identify what role patients want family members to provide and care. And so I, I think that there's really like a, um, I think there's an increasing number of, of, of ways we can sort of really try to be um, getting patients and their, their, their loved ones sort of thinking about these issues and um, working together and that will hopefully, uh, you know, continue to evolve over time. Right, and this is Caroline. This is a good question. Uh, but the uh, the other thing I do want to point out that with patient priorities care and also with a lot of work I know that Cynthia is doing is patients and caregivers are actively involved. And this type of question and work around this, you know, re research around this and care uh, uh, care planning around this and in teaching providers and, and how to deal with this, uh, it's really important to get the patients and the caregivers involved uh, as we do this, you know, because just precisely for this kind of issue, you know, how, how, do, how do we uh, help patients and caregivers communicate amongst each other as well as with the providers? So um, I think it just also, it, it, it points out, this question points out that we need the patients and caregivers involved too as we develop these models and these needs of communication. Well, we've reached the end of our time together. I, I want to thank again all of our speakers and our audience. Thank you all for attending today's webinar. The recording for the webinar will be posted soon on both the AGS and Aging Initiative websites. And as a reminder, if you're applying for CML, CME credits, you will be directed to the exam after closing out the webinar. I'd like to thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.